Harold, you shouldn't be running from your lawyer. It's bad form. And you know what I want to talk about? In a minute, Judge Powell's going to call us down. He's going to want to know if we're ready for trial. We are? We are not. And you know why not. Rule one, I get paid or I don't work. Uh, don't worry. I got your money. Exactly. You got it. I don't. It's coming. I talked to my boys. Listen, Harold, I looked on the list of people I trust. You're not on it. That's Matthew McConaughey from The Lincoln Lawyer schooling his client on how the legal system really works. It's a topic that factors into this interview I have coming up with attorney and investigative journalist William Ramsey quite prominently, especially when it comes to the case we're going to talk about, one of them, the West Memphis Three, and how it generated this ridiculous meme about satanic panic, because as you'll hear, no matter what you feel about the legal proceedings surrounding Damien Eccles and these crimes, there really should be no doubt that this is an individual that was deeply, deeply involved in satanic occult practices. And I say that, of course, because you've listened to this show with satanic being in quotes, because we can't pigeonhole all this evil and hang it on one guy. Here's a clip from the upcoming interview with William Ramsey. But he looks so innocent and harmless. But that's exactly the point I wanted to put on about the deception. He's caught with in a, in a just an outrageous lie there, right? Right. Yeah. I mean, they caught him in a lie that he was writing, like a secret script. I mean, the the allegation is that he was obsessed with the occult, right? But they denied all that. But while he was in jail, what's he doing? He's writing this secret script that has Jason Baldwin's name and Aleister Crowley. And, and then, then he gets out. What's he do? He's right back writing books about magic with a K and, t- and making all these very different interviews. He's quoting, he's talking about the moonlight. He's talking about rituals. He's, tw- he's tweeting about it. I mean, it's just incredible that people can actually be, be led on to think that that's not involved in this case. The Skeptico, where we explore controversial science and spirituality with leading researchers, thinkers, and their critics. I'm your host, Alex Sikaris, and today we welcome William Ramsey to Skeptico. William is an attorney, researcher, author, filmmaker, and creator of William Ramsey Investigates, which is really quite an amazing, impressive body of investigative journalism and interviews. I've listened to so many of them. I think I first came across William on uh, Opperman Report, and uh, he's done a ton on there, but it's just an incredible body of work, and it's really, really relevant to the stuff that I want to talk about, and that's why I reached out to William, and he was nice enough to kind of come on and talk about some of this stuff. It's such a great fit for some of the stuff I've been looking into. Hey, some of the books we should mention, I pulled them up, Abomination, Devil Worship, and Deception in the West Memphis Three. You guys have heard me mention West Memphis Three, and sometimes I say it like inside baseball, and I know there's a lot of people that don't totally get that. I mean, they get it kind of on a placeholder meme level, but William's really going to walk us through that because he's done some amazing research on that. And then there's Children of the Beast, Aleister Crowley's Shadow Over Humanity. Really interesting book. And also, I should mention uh, a Vimeo movie that you can get. We'll show that in just a minute. And then finally, Prophet of Evil, Aleister Crowley, 9-11, and the New World Order. So William just pretty amazing stuff there. It's uh, great to have you on. Thanks so much for joining me. Great. Thank you for having me. Glad to be here. So I think right off the bat, a lot of people are super intrigued, hooked into this attorney, researcher, writing books on Crowley and West Memphis Three, and not your traditional kind of uh, you know, true crime stuff. I mean, that's not, that's not at all your thing. So tell us a little bit about how you came to do what you do, William Ramsey Investigates. Well, I was always kind of a person who was willing to research things that were not covered by the corporate media. 
I went to law school in DC and worked there from 95 to 98 and saw some very remarkable things. I briefly worked on the, what they call the suicide of Vince Foster, which was really the murder of Vince Foster. He was murdered and dumped in a park, Fort Marcy Park. And okay, that we really, can't just we can't just leave that hanging for people who don't know. Quick, quick sketch of that case: what it's, how significant it is, what it's about, and why it's not a suicide. Right. So he was a lifelong friend. Actually, I think he lived in the same town as Bill Clinton. He was a lawyer. He graduated. His name was Vince Foster. Graduated first in his class at Villanova, which is a challenging law school. So it's a very significant accomplishment. And he worked in the White House. He was, I think, the chief counsel or a counsel in the White House. And he was tight. I mean, he was tight linked into those guys. He was there, absolutely. especially Hillary, right? <clears throat> I mean, a lot of other things maybe, but really. Yeah, tight. the Rose Law Firm, things going back to Arkansas. And there was all kinds of shenanigans and uh, criminality that were happening in Arkansas. There was a massive drug uh, laundering, op- running and laundering operation that was using Mena, Arkansas, which was a kind of a uh, airport that was in the middle of nowhere as a transshipment point for not millions, but billions of dollars worth of cocaine. And all that money had to be washed. And, uh, you know, there's, you can get, there's all kinds of investigations and people have talked about that aspect of how the Clintons came up in power. But uh, he was, Vince Foster was found in a Fort Marcy Park. It was called Fort Marcy because it's an old Civil War fort that was made out of berms, really large pieces of uh, the Civil War soldiers, the Union soldiers, cut down tall trees and made this fort there that protected the Potomac and Washington, D.C. during the Civil War in 1860s. And it's still a remnant and it became kind of a, became kind of a thoroughfare and it was, I mean, it has kind of a sketchy background, but he was found there in a, on a berm under unusual circumstances, he left for lunch. I can't remember the dates now. I believe it was 1994. Clinton came to the White House in 1992 and served two terms. Um, but he was found there and it was immediately called a suicide. And it was super suspicious. And I, yeah, I mean, we, like, I like, was there. Yeah, we won't go into it too far, but I, I'd like right. to know your involvement. But wasn't it crazy? Well, like, you know, burn marks, you know, gun on the left side gun, of the head. Right. He's right-handed. He was left-handed, right. right. The gun was in the hand, which is almost never happens in a suicide right. because your involuntary shock goes through your body. Uh, so it was looked like somebody who watched a Hollywood movie would stage something. And also the fact that he was lying down on a berm. So what he would have done to do that was to actually decide to walk all the way deep into this park and then lie down with his back on a berm and then perform the act, hold on to the gun, which nobody knew he owned, and then cover himself in rug fibers. And then the blood pattern would magically drift away that was non-gravitational. It was just just off the chart sketch. And there was all kinds of covered up. There were ripped up suicide notes that were found in his briefcase, they recover. I mean, it was really dark and, and very dirty. And uh, so and that was, was your kind of interest. My... How, were, how did you get connected? And what did you do? Did you wind up so, any investigations or anything? Or... Well, yeah, well, I was a I was an intern for the lawyer for Patrick Knowlton, who was one of the chief witnesses. So Patrick Knowlton, I mean, this goes back 25 years. Pat, it's, it's unbelievable. But I, the guy's name was John Clark. And he's still a lawyer in DC. And I just went to work for him. And what I did for him was compile this evidence file that was different than what was in the Starr report. And it was Kenneth Starr and the chief uh, aide for Kenneth Starr was Brent Kavanaugh, right? He was now the Supreme Court Justice. So most of the Starr report was actually written by Kavanaugh. And if you ever read through the Starr report and read through the footnotes, which I suggest you do, you should read the footnotes before you actually read the main text. Kavanaugh didn't pull any punches. There were all kinds of stories about what what Bill Clinton was really up to, how many girlfriends he had and stuff like that. Anyway, so I worked for Clark and I actually sat down with Knowlton and they're still around, they're still giving interviews. And uh, Knowlton was the first witness at the park who saw something suspicious. The FBI tried to change his or manipulate his story. After Vince Foster died, it's not really that funny, but after Vince Foster died, there was a new FBI director the next day. So the FBI director got switched out and uh, 
Yeah, so what Clark did is created something that was an, it actually is pretty fascinating because he successfully had that addendum attached to the star report by the district court of DC. It's a three person court. They actually just ruled on the Flynn case. If you're familiar with that, that's three person court. Uh, the writ of mandamus was accepted by them and they're supposed to, they were overturned the lower court with this corrupt judge, in my opinion, uh, by the name of Sullivan who handled the Flynn case in an atrocity. He just shouldn't even be on the bench. Uh, but uh, so that addendum, the Clark addendum or the Knowlton addendum to the Star Report is available and was put on there by this three-person judge who, you know, there's all kinds of facts that that Starr didn't seem to want to think. So the gripe against Kavanaugh uh, with the Clintons is personal and goes back to that. It goes back to the mid-90s. Uh, a lot of people don't know that. So a lot of this kind of specious, you know, he laughed at me while he was sexually assaulting me. Uh, there's a there's a motivation for all of that stuff that went down with Kavanaugh. So, so that was a long aside, but that was really how I kind of figured that there are stories, there are narratives, and then there's the real story. And uh, the politicization of reality is unfortunately a horrible uh, situation to endure for all Americans because you're still going through it right now. Uh, and that was one of the things that happened in this, the whole uh, Vince Foster fiasco along with so much other criminality anyway john clark had me take that addendum i was so dumb i was so naive i used to, i walked around and hand delivered it to every member of congress both in the in the senator and house of representative sides so i was just handing this thing out saying hey and i remember handing it to uh uh arlen specter's office and all these other places so i was handing it out and that started a very interesting, uh, some interesting events of, of my life. But that was really how, how I was willing to kind of address things. So that was really the big start. And I was always a researcher. I was always reading things. And I remember at the time, I was reading Michael Rivero, who does whatreallyhappened.com, who is probably, for me, one of the more important alternative uh, analysts or, or independent voices out there. But he had a website called Rancho Run Amucca, which is was for, that's how far back I go and all that stuff. So that's really the start. So then, you know, I started researching let, parapolitics. Let, let me ask you this, because, you know, I've noticed that, and I know this for myself, but there's this stripping away of the layers of the onion that I think a lot of us go through, you know? So you start, I can only imagine such a great story. I mean, you're an intern, you're so impressionable. Like you say, you're laughing at yourself for being naive, you know, and we can all relate to starting a career and just doing what they say and kind of following the numbers. 100%. 100%. What was it like though, as you got, I mean, the stuff you're doing right now is so, so far out there. I imagine that yourself back then couldn't even imagine you getting to where you're at now with this stuff in terms of being far out there. I can relate to that my, for myself. You know, I was always like, I would have laughed at this stuff 10 years ago. And now it's like so, so real. It's I think so. I was, you know, I was like always listening to people talking about JFK. So that was probably my thing. And I always thought they were kind of kooky and like, oh, this, this thing. And but now I think they were all right. And I didn't understand the kind of secret society element, the elite mechanisms of control through the media. So I had to learn really a lot of that stuff firsthand. And uh, yeah, so I mean, I was super naive. I, was, I believed everything in my books. I followed the path of high school, college. You know, these are the state tiers of success. And, you know, I, I saw a whole different story. It's pretty amazing too, because... And when I was in D.C., I, I had very close friends who worked in these law firms. And I actually know, like, uh, like the attorney for Jeffrey Epstein before he was murdered. Like, I used to go over to their law offices on Fridays for free beer and, like, see all these guys, Reed Weingarten. So I saw, I mean, I just saw a lot of stuff firsthand. I know people who worked at uh, an, uh, the Plato Kacharis, who was, uh, it was, uh, Lewinsky's attorney. So I used to go to Plato Kacharis's office. I, cause all my friends, we were all interns, you know, so we were all just kind of in the same kind of tier of reality at that time. So anyway, that's yeah. why, like I doubted Epstein died, committed suicide too. 
but you know, yeah. so the, these things do happen. These things really do happen. And there's a lot, and I never really kind of considered the occult, which, you know, is really something that I really started out with. Like nobody really wanted to talk about occult ideas, influencing political events or the culture, at least at my time, you know, a lot of people would kind of dismiss you or, you know, you're, I've already been called a conspiracy theorist, theorist but my books, I really tried to very rigorously cite them and, and try to maintain a higher academic standard. Uh, but Well, I anyway. think that's what comes through. And I think that's what kind of intrigues people is you have that kind of uh, lawyer sensibility. And as you give more of the background, you can understand, you know, I think a lot of people don't even understand the different jobs that attorneys do. And, you know, just you're kind of giving us an insight into how you think. And I think some of that is from your legal training. Now, tell me more, though, about the occult thing. Because, you know, one of the things I want to I feel like is kind of hanging in the shadows here, because when I originally contacted you, I told you this project I'm working on, and it's why evil matters. And it's really this idea that uh, it's kind of like the, the, you know, as I described in this show, you know, kind of alternative science or frontier science and frontier spirituality. And by that, I mean, you know, I think there's a lot of things that are happening in science that is pointing towards this larger and more expansive view of consciousness. Easy one to point to is near-death experience, you know, or reincarnation, either one. Solid science you can point to. I think, you know, 200 peer-reviewed papers, at least in near-death experience. And the work that's done, been done in reincarnation, particularly at the University of Virginia, is just stellar work. That no one challenges that. And it's been my position, not really position, just what I've observed over the last 10 years that I've done that, is that has shifted the dialogue uh, from, you know, we're going to talk about culture a lot, I think, because when you talk about West Memphis 3, that's what I love about that case. It pops us right in the middle of this, and it yeah. it starts splitting up some of these things, like the, the occulted satanic culture and how there's this wink and nod and do what thou wilt and I can lie, cheat, steal, do whatever I have to, I can deceive you because that's part of it, man, you know. But then at the same time that we never talk about is there is this twin part of it that just isn't exposed. And that is the atheistic, uh, you're a biological robot and meaningless universe part of science. So you go to neuroscience and it's still, I mean, I repeat this every freaking show, but I can't help it. They don't believe that you have not only free will, they don't believe that you have experience. They don't believe that consciousness is real. And when I say that, they mean that consciousness is purely an illusion. It's a byproduct of the brain. And when you get stuck in that materialistic paradigm, and science is built on that, psychology is built on that, neuroscience, and you know all this, but I'm just repeating it. You can't even begin to process satanic ritual abuse. However, you're going to pull that apart. You would say, what I've heard religious scholars tell me on this show, it doesn't matter if it's true. It only matters what they believe. And I'm like, well, no, you, you, you got that completely backwards. The first thing that matters is, is there this extended realm of consciousness? And are they somehow connecting with some malevolent force in that realm? You may not, you may dismiss that, but at least you got to look at the evidence for that. And before you dismiss it and say, well, that can't possibly be true. But the funny thing about our culture is we have this dual thing going on where both are operating, where there's this, you know, Johnny Depp, uh, Duncan Trussell, wink and a nod, you know, of course it's all happening, you know, in this extended realm. And then you got this other side of Neil deGrasse Tyson, you know, of course, consciousness is an illusion. And then here's the shadow part that I just got to get out there because I don't want it to be like hanging is you have the, the religious part and the Christian part. And that I think when we do an interview like this, and I talk to you, and that's why I'd rather get it out up front. There's going to be a lot of people who are going to watch the movie, read the book, and they're going to be, oh, okay, I get it. This guy has a Christian agenda, and he's going to start preaching to me and telling me his narrowly defined understanding of how I need to relate to God, how I need to relate to that ultimate 
thing that's most important in everyone's life is their, their soul, you know, and, and what that soul means to them. So thrown a lot on the table there, but uh, it's well, mainly just back. Well, I'm impressed because I think you covered the kind of uh, little, the, you know, in a general sense, the, the groups that are influencing the culture. You've got the kind of occultist, you've got the materialist scientists like uh, Nick Grass Tyson or Steven Pinker or Krauss or some of these other guys or the, the Darwinists. And then, you know, you can put me right in that Christian camp. I'm comfortable with that. I don't really think that I'm, uh, I'm promoting a real a specific kind of sectarian agenda within Christianity, but I definitely am a Christian, 100%. Okay, so let's just touch on that for just a second. Before we go there, though, I did say I want to I want to visit your Vimeo channel and show people some of the videos on there, and I want you to talk about that. And then we're going to talk about a couple of interviews I've done. One with Opperman, who I think has a fantastic show. Man, it's such a go-to show. He's just got to get rid of those trashy commercials. The only way I can listen to it is with my little player, my hand, my thumb right there. Skip. Okay. Now, come on, Ed, give me something good. But I want to talk about Opperman. And then I also want to talk about Russ Dizdar. You know, Russ? Sure. Yeah. We go okay. back. So a little two ahead. guys, two guys I've interviewed and I, because I, I, I want to get that Christian thing handled. And then I want to dive into uh, Damian Eccles because I think that'll get us right back to all these things we're going. I want you to tell people a little bit about some of the work that you've done on Vimeo because you've taken the books that I showed and you've done some really cool videos and some of them have, you know, a lot of slideshow kind of stuff, but you have some great video in there. You have a really good voice for this stuff. You make it work and you can listen, you can watch here if you're watching, but some of the stuff, you know, Johnny Depp and Eccles, and then you got stuff on the process church. So, Tell us a little bit about what's going on on Vimeo. And then I have another one that I watched last night, Children of the Beast, a video you did on Aleister Crowley. So tell folks a little bit about how these movies came to happen and, you know, how you feel about them. Well, they were kind of outgrowths from my books. So I've done, uh, other than The Smiley Face Killers, which is about this, I think it's one of the most important true crime stories that hasn't really been told nationally, which is the abduction and disappearance of young men for the last 25 years, not only in the U.S., but all over the world. But uh, the other ones, the Children of the Beast was an outgrowth of my book, and I really just wanted to kind of make a more visual approach to that so that people could see that. Because a lot of the books, if you put too much in, too many images in there, it distracts from the narrative. But uh, if you kind of put it into a documentary format, I think people also can learn and see things uh, visually much better, obviously, in the documentary. So Children of the Beast, Alistair Crow Prophet of Evil, Alistair Crowley, 9-11 in the New World Order is another documentary. And then Occult Hollywood, Volume 2 is out there. So I've got five full-length documentaries. <laughs> My Children of the Beast documentary is beyond uh, full length. It's three and a half hours of uh, things, of, of, of events that people say aren't happening, which is men disappearing, found in water. Uh, a judge to accidental death over and over again, hundreds of times. But uh, so that's how those really came about. And uh, that's really the, the it. So the like Children of the Beast was really an outgrowth of my research into Crowley, which was an outgrowth of my research into 9-11, which was just a general outgrowth of my interest in parapolitics para or occult politics, maybe. Um, and okay. like all those things, like that's how, that's how my interest in the smiley face killers came about is because I kept seeing the symbol in my research into Crowley. And then it led me to think, okay, well, what are the smiley face killers? Is this an urban myth? And then I started studying it. And then I started seeing people or young men disappear and end up in water. The first one I studied was a guy by the name of Joey Labute out of Columbus, Ohio. And then I just was watching it. And my chief researcher, Jim Smith is really been on the story. I think he's the best researcher out there on the subject. There are multiple ones. Gilbertson and Gannon from, were the original kind of inquirers into the study. They wrote a book called Case Studies of Forensic Science, uh, Forensic Drowning. The interesting thing to me that I was totally unaware of 
is that you connect the smiley face, the, the smiley face killer thing that a lot of people have kind of heard about and don't know kind of what to do with it. And you've connected it to some of these same strange occult signaling, satanic signaling that's going on. And it is funny because ever since you mention it, I start seeing that smiley face in art, in t-shirts, in all the right slash wrong places. And I like how you're very careful. Uh, again, you have this kind of investigator sensibility, just the facts, ma'am, in terms of, and you build your case slowly, you don't jump to a lot of conclusions. And even when we're gonna talk about uh, Crowley and talk about the West Memphis Three, you know, you're very, you're very careful to build your, your case counselor. So l let me just touch on the, the Christian thing, because here's, I think, the, the catch, that, and then I wanna let it go. But there is this sense among a lot of people that if someone is Christian, that they are, they're so agenda driven, and I'm guilty of accusing Christians of this too, because I think Christians do not accept their culpability in some of this stuff. And culpability in the sense that just how the average person processes this. And so really, in this day, with the Catholic Church outed as systematic sexual abuse from the highest level directed from the Pope, you're going to tell me that this folds right into, you know, Jesus on the cross, Son of God, screw you. And, and further, I mean, what Crowley is saying, and, and this is what, this is the, especially the reason I think we need to pull the Christian part about it, is that one way to read the Crowley narrative, the Crowley biography, and I think it's totally the wrong way, but it's the way they keep doing it is, he was rebelling against it, just incredibly overbearing Christian father who really was kind of a kooky, anyone would say, you know, it's taken the Christian thing way to this kooky extreme, no birthday parties, no presents, no Christmas, you know, all this cultish kind of stuff. And that, of course, you know, then we can pack it back into the psychology, you know, oh, you know, and then we never have to deal with the real stuff that's going on. And I would maintain, and then I'm going to let you respond to it. Maybe I'll play a couple of clips from Ed and, uh, and Russ Dizdar, and then we'll, we'll move on. But I'd say the same kind of thing with the rest of West Memphis Three. When you break that down, it's going to, if people haven't heard your stuff before, it's going to be stunning because you stack the evidence and it's just overwhelming. But people are still going to process it as, oh, man, satanic panic. Those damn Christians right. are at it again. They can't, you know, da, 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 da. So in general, go ahead and, and respond. I think that's fair. I mean, I'm glad, I'm glad that you brought up the Catholic Church because that's the exemplar that antagonists of what they believe Christianity, even in Crowley too, who's, he was part of the exclusive brethren uh, by uh, Darby, who many argue isn't even an authentic Christian. So he's definitely within this wide, broad tent of what's def defined as Christianity. But that's a very generalist kind of way to put it. I don't think Darby was, I mean, he was a dispensa dispensationalist. There are all kinds of problems with his theology. I mean, some people have written, written stuff that this, and a lot, some of these Christians are very, Christian leaders in different sects are very comfortable with the occult. Supposedly, like Darby, I need to research that more, but also Joseph Smith, the guy who started the Watchtower, the uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, there's all kinds of problems. So it's, you got, I think that you, uh, and I think that this actually happens often is like you can, look at the gospel as a kind of caricature and then say, you're just going to throw that agenda on people. I know what happens and that's fine. I don't even describe myself as a, as a kind of sectarian Christian. I'm really just a Bible believing Christian. So I think that the real basis of any proper definition of that faith would be to see what's in the gospels and what input, what is in Paul writing, Paul's writings. And that should be the basis for it, not the church. The Catholic church is hyper corrupt. I mean, the kind of things that have been gone in there and the doctrines that are there. And even Crowley himself, it's interesting you bring Crowley up. He actually favored Catholicism. He actually said that the real enemy were the Protestants and the Jews. 
So he had this kind of like uh, tolerance for it. And even some of his religion that he adopted, he took from Orthodox Christianity. So his whole cult uh, Gnostic maths is from Orthodox Church. And he absorbed a lot of Christian teachings and twisted it. But yeah, you're right. So Darby himself. So I think that these critiques are are common. They're they're fair, but I think that they can be addressed. And that's fine. You can look at me. You can look at me through whatever lens you want. But if you want to look at the facts that I've written about in those books, they're all fairly long. They're all footnoted. They're almost none of my uh, subjective opinions. They're really just reference points. They're properly referenced, in my opinion. And then you can take it as, uh, as what you want to believe. So, you know, right there, we're cool. <laughs> yeah, well, we're, we're getting into epistemology, right? Like, why do you believe what you believe? Exactly. So, and and, and, and to mean, that end, you know, I pulled up the, the interview that I, I did with Ed, and, you know, I just rattled his, his, his chain, but I'm, I'm glad I did. I mean, I don't, I don't mind pushing people in that way. But what Ed said that really kind of set me off and I pushed on him and then he got really pissed off is he's like, why do you care what I believe? Why do you care what I believe? And it's like, you don't get it, Ed. That is the whole thing. You're entering this realm. You're entering this battlefield. Yes, I care what you believe. Just like when I had Hugh Urban on, Dr. Hugh Urban from Ohio State University, telling me about his book on Scientology and how it didn't matter that Crowley and Jack Parsons were performing a ritual in the desert to bring forth uh, Antichrist right. through the Whore of Babylon. And he right. said, hey, it doesn't matter if there's any reality to it. It just matters, you know, what they believe. That is, if Christians don't understand that it matters what they believe, and they better be ready so. to defend what they believe, or as you do, separate that and say, I would like to keep my personal beliefs, my relationship with God out of this, and instead, look at my 100 pages of footnotes, look at all my documents, look at all that, and just take that on its own merit, which is, you know, I, I, again, I'm not, I don't care about Ed's and like I love his show and stuff it's just that lust thing I had Russ Dizzer on fantastic tremendous amount of information because Russ got what I was saying and right from the beginning he was like no Alex you want me to approach this with just giving you the the facts for satanic ritual abuse and I'm going to tell you about the victims. I'm going to tell you about what we find when we go to these sites and what we observe in terms of the, you know, inverted pentagram, the language, all this stuff, and let that kind of tell the story. And, and that's what I like. But I mean, we're all biased. We all have our own outlook. I mean, I can't, I can't detach that from my books, my personality, and the way I believe about things. So I, I think people requiring total objectivity is unattainable. So people like always say, oh, you're biased. Well, everybody's biased. Age, race, education, gender, politics. So I think that that's fair. It really, I think when you look at, like I listen to the left and right, I don't really mind as long as they're really being honest. That's really what I want. They're being honest with the facts. And that's really what I tried to have is an integrity towards the, the reader or listener of my videos, like this is just what they thought. I don't do a lot of editorializing. I really, I mean, unlike corporate media or CNN or MSNBC and all this trash that shouldn't exist. So I don't mind defending. I mean, we can do a defense of Christianity, like what you think the true Christianity is or what is. I don't stand with some, some of these people, other people would call Christian or what, what would be the foundations of that faith. Another show. That's and, yeah, and I don't think it's our show. show. It's not the show that we need to do because the show that we need to do is is on your books because you already totally get where I'm coming from and you picked up the the trail immediately because you're a good attorney and you kind of saw through that. But what I think is interesting is the link, the path, and the Damien Eccles thing is just fascinating to me and we're going to approach it and tear it apart you know so i've been on the trail of the crowley thing and i i and, and i have friends who are in the magical community if you will and i have friends that are trying to make sense of that in a way that isn't crazy 
that I don't think is evil, that I don't think is demonic. I'm not sure that really works at the end of the game, at the end of the day, in terms of my understanding of spirituality. But I respect that people have different ways of doing that. And I don't think that everyone who, who looks in that direction is, you know, damned or condemned or even doing it for, for evil purposes. So uh, with that, you know, I just want to get to the facts because I did this interview uh, for my book with a guy I really like at Forum Borealis and I did it with Al and I started, you know, going into the Crowley test, what I call it. Like all I have to do is throw out Crowley. And when I get the apologist for Crowley, I just start tearing them apart. I go, how does that make any sense to you? This is exactly what he said. How does this make any sense to you? He did this. He admitted to diddling little kids. I mean, he admitted yeah. to that. He acknowledged that he had children present during his sex magic. Enc encouraged it, right. He encouraged it. So, yeah, but there's all this apologist stuff. And that's the test that immediately splits it. But I'm kind of jumping ahead because I want to go back to People don't really know. Like uh, I was telling you, Foreign Borealis, he's in, uh, he's in uh, uh, Europe, he's in Norway. And I'm rattling off West Memphis 3, and he's like, what's West Memphis 3? So, right, so right. if you can, just sketch out the, the big picture of West Memphis 3. And I think the other thing that I'd love to have you talk about, and then I'm going to hit you with some more questions on the details, because they're fantastic, is what happened to West Memphis 3? Because you know that the general impression is, well, they just found him innocent that they didn't right. do it. Right. Right. So they're supposedly innocent. They were arrested for a crime they did not commit. These are the standard kind of PR axioms that you'll see in almost every uh, article that is pro-West Memphis 3, which there really aren't any very, there's very few anti-West Memphis 3 out there. But the true crime story really started in... May 5th of 1993, after three young boys went disappeared, they were eight years old, right in line with Crowley's teachings on human sacrifice in magic and theory of practice. They were eight years old. They went, they disappeared. They were found the next day in a ditch in a, in a little area called Robin Hood Hills outside of West Memphis, west of Memphis, Tennessee, across the Mississippi River. And they were, two were found later after a medical examination to have been drowned. They were tied up in a very strange manner, ankle to wrist. One had bled out after his genitals had been removed. And so it was a particularly graphic and brutal crime. There was blood all over the place. It was never admitted into court, but the luminol tests were taken. And so there was blood all over that area. And there was an outcry trying to figure out who, who did this. There was a suspect that was mentioned by a probation officer by the name of Jerry Driver, who said that this young man by the name of Damien Eccles, real name, given name was Michael Hutchison, was his born name, but he changed his name to his stepfather's last name and took on the name Damien. And so he was investigated, he was brought into the, uh, and according to the, court, the records that are on the police records, he was brought into the police office, he was questioned, he failed a polygraph test. He said, if I talk to my mom, I'll tell you everything. He let me talk to my mom, so he went and talked to his mom. Then he clammed up, but the investigative investigation continued. They didn't have enough evidence to arrest any of them until they brought in another young man by the name of Jesse Miss Kelly on June 3rd of 1993, who then confessed and implicated Damien Eccles and Jason Baldwin. And all three were arrested. They were tried separately uh, due to some evidence that was going to be put in a trial. And 24 jurors found them both guilty. Damien, uh, Damien Eccles was over 18. He was given the capital punishment. Uh, and the other two pretty much got life sentences. Um, and then there was the probably the key lever in creating doubt in the public's mind was the involvement of an HBO documentary. There was really a trilogy. The first one was titled Paradise Lost, which came out in 1996. And then there were two others that uh, I think it was 2001 and maybe 2004. I can't remember the exact dates of when those came out, but there were three and they cast doubt upon the guilt. The first one kind of was somewhat ob objective. 
Uh, but the second one kind of blamed one of the stepfathers by the name of Byers. And then the third one pretty much implicated another man by the name of Terry Hobbs, created kind of a furor. It, it snowballed. Other people got involved. Celebrities got involved. Money was raised. Uh, possibly they're saying with a huge amount of money, 10 to $20 million. Probably the best appellate attorney out there got involved and put pressure on the state government uh, through new laws that had been created about DNA testing. And there was going to be a hearing in 2011, I think in December, to judge whether some of this DNA could be used. But in August 2011, an agreement was reached and the three pled guilty. So they already had all been found guilty. Uh, they pled guilty again to first degree murder. They admitted on signed documents, you know, they're adults now, but through the best attorneys really available, uh, that there was enough evidence to possibly convict them again. They went to court. They were put under 10 years of probation. They were let out while professing innocence on something called an Alford plea, which is a Supreme Court case uh, based on a Supreme Court case called Alford v. North Carolina. And which allows you to profess your innocence publicly while pleading guilty. So they're basically guilty. They're still guilty and under probation until next year. I asked you to keep it vanilla and man, you really <laughs> kept it vanilla. Cause let me, let me kind of pull you into the real stuff. Like anyone who goes and Googles West Memphis three, I'm not exaggerating the first five, you know, first 10, second 10, third 10 satanic panic, satanic panic, satanic panic. That's the only thing you hear about this case. It doesn't have anything to do with the facts. It's all, and, and that's what's going to be so interesting as we dive into this. Why did this become the kind of poster child for satanic panic? And why do we think that, that that's not accidental? It's, it's just, it, it can't be. And all, again, all the wrong people wind up lining up with this guy and flashing, you know, satanic signs and all the rest with this guy. And Statements, yeah, all kinds of stuff. I mean, it's all over there. So why is it satanic panic if the guy's a member of the OTO while he's in jail, while he's also just recently admitted to be part of AA, but specifically traced to Crowley, who wrote in his own writing on Vice that he was prosecuted for his love of the knowledge of Aleister Crowley specifically. And it just Crowley's name pops up all over us. And that's really what piqued my interest in this whole case. Isn't it true, William, that we have evidence of him like performing a satanic ritual in a burning garage that he set on fire? I mean, and then go ahead on that one. Well, that's true. I mean, that's in the, that was an original case. They say that he was prosecuted for wearing black, but he was actually arrested before the events for kind of moonlighting, I think, in a abandoned trailer. And then there was testimony of all kinds of weird stuff he was doing. And there was other statements in the court files, which I included in my book about them hanging out at Stonehenge, the involvement, in, I mean, just crazy stuff off the charts. Off the charts, and you do do an amazing job in the film. Let me pause for a minute. Let me see if I can pull that pull that up. The best type of human sacrifice, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. But Alistair Crowley doesn't have any particular significance to you. So the prosecutor at trial had a photocopy of Alistair Crowley's magic in theory and practice on his desk. I know who he is. I've read a little bit about him, but I've never read anything by him. Let me show you. Okay, I'll, I'll stop it there if I can. But I want to give people a little bit of a taste for the excellent movie that you put together. Tell us what's happening there with all that, that you really feel for that kid. I have to say, I know they prep these, these defendants, but he looks so innocent and harmless. But that's exactly the point I wanted to put on about the deception. He's caught with in a, in a just an outrageous lie there, right? Right, yeah. I mean, they caught him in a lie that he was writing like a secret script. I mean, the, the allegation is that he was obsessed with the occult, right? But they denied all that. But while he was in jail, what's he doing? He's writing this secret script that has Jason Baldwin's name and Alistair Crowley. And, and then, then he gets out. What's he do? He's right back 
writing books about magic with a K and, t- and making all these very different interviews. He's quoting, he's talking about the moonlight. He's talking about rituals. He's, tw- he's tweeting about it. I mean, it's just incredible that people can actually be, be led on to think that that's not involved in this case. So I want to touch on two things. I want to hit on the deception thing in a minute, because I think if people aren't aware that that is part of the ethos that is built into this system of beliefs, which is that I can lie to you. It's okay for me to lie to get my, my end. Deception is in, it's right in the title of your book. Do you, do you want to speak to that? Have you found that to be true? Absolutely. I think that they lie about all that stuff. They lie about their secret society uh, associations, about who their friends are, about their signals. There's a real wink and a nod, just like you mentioned, within these groups. So I think that not disclosing, you know, omission, what did Orwell say? Omission is the greatest form of lie. So they admit to tell you all this stuff, that there's all kinds of weird associations. I mean, there's some doc, I mean, it's un- I mean there's so much deception in this case that almost everything that's pro- proffered by uh, Eccles and some things, and just nothing is really that honest. He said that he was sick, that he was beaten in jail all the time, that his teeth were going to fall out, that they had to take the deal because he was going to die. Hey guys, I just wanted to jump in for one second with a couple additional points that I wish I would have asked William, but I didn't. So I'm going to try and get those in here. And these come directly out of his book, Abomination, Devil Worship and Deception in the West Memphis Three Murders. And it's really important for getting to the bottom of this question of whether Damien Eccles did these deeds, these horrible, evil deeds. And I have to make the distinction because a lot of people don't get this. It doesn't speak to whether or not he should have been released, you know, whether there were some technical uh, requirements in the legal system that weren't met or whether any of that stuff. That's separate from whether the guy did it. But the guy did it. I mean, the interview he has in the book, the inter- the police interviews they did. And these police interviews are tricky because police in these situations do some pretty... I don't know now, to me, kind of shady kind of thing. Like one of the things they do to people is they say, okay, uh, wh- who do you imagine would have done this crime? So they, they get him down this whole line. But listen to what he says. First, Damien confirmed that he liked to read books and one of his favorite writers was Church of Satan founder Anton LaVey and the Satanic Bible. Now that, again, you know, for the people who are apologists for Satanism. They're like, hey, you know, you should be able to read whatever you want. Sure, you should be able to read whatever you want. But they ask him specific questions about the murder. And they say, you know, Damien, again, what would you, how would you imagine it going down? And he said, well, he figured that the killer knew the kids in the woods and even asked them to come out to the woods. He stated that the boys were not big, not smart, and they could have been easy to control. He also felt that the killer would not have worried about screaming due to being in the woods and close to the expressway. And then he said some important factual details. Damien said that the bodies of all the boys had been mutilated and one had been mutilated a lot more than the others. This is a fact that was not known to anyone except those at the crime scene because the police never released this information. He also said that Steve Jones from the Juvenile Authority had told him about how the boy's testicles had been cut off and that someone had urinated in their mouths. Damien said that that could have been the reason why their bodies were placed in the water, so that the urine could have been washed out. This is another critical piece of evidence because this information was never released. Steve Jones from the Juvenile Authority had no way of knowing that and couldn't have told that to Damien. Only someone at the crime scene could have known that. So, again, I'll leave it off there because I hate all this nasty, gory, true crime stuff. But, again, pack this back into the question of whether or not this is a case of satanic panic. Okay, back to the interview. You know, all kinds of crazy stuff that 
you look at the totality, it's just nonsense. It's really hard for people to believe that in real, like literal Satanism, that there's groups of networked people out there. And I think that that's really the hardest part of addressing the West Memphis Three. I think you're absolutely right about that. You know, one of the uh, chapters I have in my book is an interview that I did with this woman uh, named Annika Lucas. And she's really a, a, a lovely person and we connected we both like yoga and she's a yoga teacher for incarcerated women in upstate New York. And she's got this transformation that she's gone through in her life. And she would have to, because at six years old, she was sold by her mother to a satanic ritual, occult abuse network in Belgium. Right. Belgium. This, right. Was she, that, was she associated with the Dutro thing? Well, she's careful about uh, who she names, but it's very clear that that is the group that had her because she mentions, and, and that's fascinating too, right? Because talk about history repeating itself. You know, there was this big, you know, drain the swamp and this is this pedo ring. And, you know, as I tell people, anyone has any doubts, you can still Google the photos of kids in cages, tied up, you know, just all the most horrible of the horrible things you can see. And her account is that she was going to be killed. She had been raped like uh, thousands of times, six years old, remember, six years old by her mother. Um, and, and, but the interesting thing I always alert people to is that if you want to take a secular perspective on this, it doesn't work because what these people are doing, and they will tell you what they're doing, is they are trying to, one, connect with some malevolent force in this extended realm. And they're trying to connect with that force for a reason, to bring in a certain energy into this realm. And that's why they connect with Aleister Crowley. And so many, it's nothing unique about Aleister Crowley. It's just many people have chosen that at all costs, they are so attached to this world and what they can get out of this world, that any entity in that extended realm that connects and offers that chance, they'll do it. And so please. I, well, I that's, I'm glad you brought up that case because it was totally networked. It was covered up. There was all kinds of shenanigans that took place under the surface, like the prosecutor got fired. And there's an incredible German documentary that traces just the people that were murdered around uh, the Dutro case that knew too much. It's like 25 people. Like I knew too much. I mean, they're going to kill me. Ends up dead. Another person says, I've got information on this. Gets run over by a car. It's incredible. It's like JFK, you know, all the people who knew about that who ended up dead. It's incredible. The Dutro case, if you don't think that that's networked evil, I'm sorry, you're just wrong because it went to the highest levels of that elite. And Dutro was known to leave Belgium. He was moving around Europe. So they don't even know the totality of what happened in the horror show. Like two of the kids died because he was in jail and couldn't feed him in the dungeon. And that's, so that's a real problem. Like this, they can't, people cannot connect to spiritual evil. And I'm glad you brought that up because that's what these people are doing. That's what Crowley was doing. If you read his corpus and all the stuff, he's talking to entities. He's traveling through the astral plane. He's got AWOS and the wizard and Alamantra working, the Jurensis working, Corrin's on, you know, he's supposedly talking to all these people. How literal, I mean, I, it's hard to say I'm there, but that's what a lot of these things are doing is summoning demons. And that's who's giving him information. That's what he's writing down. So uh, I think that magic, that's really it. And the, the real argument is, is like, are these figments of your imagination or is there something outside of your personality that people are, are perceiving, right? And I mean, I think in the mag, if you want to talk about the magical community, that's an argument. However, I don't know how Crowley could have written down or, uh, like a gray alien back in 1918 in New York after an Alamantra working. So that is such a stretch for the imagination. And you still see this kind of reference alien extraterrestrial. What, what if they're extra dimensional? So, and they, they see when people do Yage or they do ayahuasca, there's always this green man they're talking to. People have, have these weird entity experiences. And that may be all the UFO phenomenon really is. 
is really people who are um, having extra, you know, extra dimensional events, not extraterrestrial. So, and we go, I could talk about that in Children of the Beast, ballet, talking to McMurtry and all these other guys. But, uh, well, I, I think yeah. you know, here's where I want to go with that. And I don't know if we've, maybe we've hammered on this enough or, or maybe not, I can't tell, but there's this, there's this double speak going on, you know, the cultural part of it, and I'm struggling. I'd like you to talk more about the culture around Satanism and occultism. And I don't want to use those words in the way that they're usually used. You know, I mean, I had Oxford Christian scholar, Richard Smoley, how God became God, super great guy, scholar, religious scholar, and remains a Christian. But he'll point out to you that historically, Satan, you know, isn't in the pre-Torah writings, and he kind of pops in after Zoroaster. And we have all these things of the reality, we're co-creating reality. I talked to, William, you can't tell you how many near-death experience people I've talked to, but I talked to a guy just the other day, fantastic guy. I have no doubt about his Christ consciousness experience, because that's what happened to him. He died. He was actually he went to kiss his girlfriend at the commuter train and the door closed on his coat. Oh, wow. Dragged him under the train and he died. And he saw Jesus and he had this incredible experience. I don't doubt that he had this incredible experience in this consciousness realm with Jesus. But then I asked him, I said, you know, David, a lot of people I've talked to that have multiple near-death experiences, they sometimes say that the, the Christ figure kind of gives way to an even greater and a higher God, you know, and there's hierarchy. And he goes, I can't deny that that isn't true because I got a sense that there's more for me and stuff like that. I'm not trying to, like, I'm not trying to kind of preach to you on, on any of that stuff. I'm just trying, what that opens up to me is the possibility that we need to consider an unbelievably varied realm in this extended realm, which is even more complicated than our realm. And that to be, because we don't know what these guys are doing exactly. And, and I'm, I'm uncomfortable with just saying a demon, but they wanted a demon. I just don't think we know enough. We know it's evil. We know it's dark. And I'm just kind of rambling here. So save. Well, no, but I think it's interesting because you can even look out of the biblical context of the, these like uh, demonic entities are all through kind of the global, mythos through all of these legends and stuff like that that there's bad spirits almost every culture has some kind of reference to these kind of things that are outside of themselves um not ghosts or something but some kind of evil presence so it's a commonality not just kind of in the bible where the new testament talks about christ being tempted by satan and there's actually references to uh you know satan right there at the end before in jerusalem at the Last Supper with Judas, right? Satan enters into Judas and he goes and betrays Christ. Uh, so, but even there's even a reference to Satan in, in Isaiah, for example, which is the Old Testament. But yeah, before that, maybe not so much, but there's definitely even the Mosaic is, is fighting against. It's interesting because in the Bible, Paul mentions Moses contesting against the two magicians of the time uh, in Pharaoh's court, Janus and Jambres, but they're not mentioned in the, the Exodus or Mosaic narrative. So Paul seemed to have some reference to these two magicians. And there are magicians in the Bible, like Simon Magus and the witch at Endor. So this kind of magical tradition is a part of human civilization, a dark magic, maybe, if you want to call it that. But, uh, you know, so, so something outside of yourself, like some demon, I think, extra entity or something like that, isn't that hard to believe. And then if you want to say like on people who've had experienced miracles, near death experiences, um, you know, there's varieties of religious experience, just like that book said. So I don't think it's outside of that. I mean, so, it happens so, whether it's within the tradition, Christian tradition or not. Right. So we're kind of pushed in this box. So we're, we're, we're kind of in agreement that, that we're being kind of pushed in this box to either deny evil. And when I say evil, you know, let's try and work towards a definition. 
this kind of soul crushing extra dimensional help in order to destroy someone's soul that's evil we can kind of right, drive right, that right, one to the ground right, say okay i don't know about right. drone striking you know a wedding party in yemen which i think right. is pretty bad but evil, who knows yeah. it, it has some geopolitical aim or something like that. this we we can more clearly say yeah that's uh, can't see any other way that that isn't evil so then what is the play in culture? Why do we have this, this divide? Why do we have, like we talked about at the very beginning, you know, the Neil deGrasse Tyson, who we, we really think is probably just completely oblivious, you know, is just happy living in his materialistic world. And then you got the kind of Hollywood, you know, which you've just explored extensively is going like, man, we're, we're way past you guys. We're, we're yeah. using this, we're using the force. Right. Oh, well, yeah, that's a good point. I mean, look at Johnny Depp. He supposedly uses these entities to inform himself on all of his roles. Like he's fully involved in these things in like what would be called evil. If you want to define, like people ask me, why do you like you're an admirer of Crowley or you seem to talk about him in laudatory terms? I don't. I called him the prophet of evil. He thought he was a prophet of a new aeon. I believe is evil because all of his ideas are antithetical towards the treatment of uh, society really in general. It's super selfish. You lie, like you said, well, we can go over this theme of our conversation. You lie, you manipulate, the slave shall serve. Uh, you know, Crowley was kind of like a classist of the worst sort. But uh, I think the definition of evil is like what people are willing to do to their fellow man to get worldly benefits, whether it's money, sex, fame, uh, kind of the standards, the standard sins. And then you can kind of counterpoise, pose that at least in the teaching of Christianity, which are somewhat universal, is like Christ is a servant, right? So he's, and you turn the other cheek and, you know, there's these teachings here where you're not supposed to propagate trauma or hurt on somebody else. That's kind of like what turning the other cheek is. You don't strike back. And so it does, it kind of lessens, uh, you know, whatever whatever harms are going out there. It doesn't it doesn't it doesn't engender that kind of kind of malevolence towards people. You know, people hurting each other. So, you know, I can I can definitely see Crow and Crowley himself was in really. I mean, it's interesting too about how many of these occultists really are Christ and Christian haters, whether it's Hubbard or Crowley or Hitler, or some of these other people, how they really deliberately counterpoise themselves against the teaching of Christ. And, and I think there's a couple interesting things, and I don't know if we can kind of smooth this out and hit all the points, but there's, there's one is the, um, you know, and this is in the Crowley thing, and maybe you can pick up on it and elaborate on it, but the, the do what thou wilt ethos, which whenever you talk to a Crowley apologist, they jump on that. They go, you don't know what that means. You don't know what that really means. I go, his whole life is about that. I mean, look at his life. Look at the deeds, you know, the fruit. Um, but I guess related to that is, is kind of this um, Sabbatean Frankish kind of, we can't all be saints, so let's all be sinners. And this kind of Crowley, I want to do the most horrible, but then they twist it into, again, this Christian thing of, it because that will, in this twisted way, bring about the next coming of Christ. Right. It, right. You want to speak to that at all? Well, I mean, I think that, you know, Crowley said he got, got power from transgression, and I think that's a very common theme within occultists or Satanists or whatever, however you want to call them. So, uh, and I think that the worst crimes, I think, are, you know, it's an inversion. So um, definitely it's there in Crowley. And it, it was funny, like, somebody asked Crowley, what if you have two people whose wills doing the, what they will, what if they conflict? What if they're headbutt over it and he didn't have an answer for that so you can just see is the wreckage of Crowley's life the ruined lives the wrecked lives the suicides you know he would just uh it was like an energy drain on almost all of his scarlet women 
branding him on the chest. And then when he was done, they were done. They were not giving him the spiritual energy that he wanted. And he just moved on. So uh, I don't think that his life, I mean, if the apologists think that he lived an exemplary life, I think that they're deluding themselves. There's a lot of delusion in the Crowley followers. And there's a lot of uh, simplification there. A lot of these people don't really, the people who admire Crowley only saw him one side, which is his religion, but not his real personality and the way he behaved toward others, you know? So uh, I don't think that the truth, they, I think, I think if they look at the truth of really what he did, and that was really one of the things that why I was inspired to write a book about Crowley is because of all of the, you know, kind of uh, expurgated elements of his life that people just left out. They just call him a great man, a liberator of humanity and all this other stuff. But he was down, I mean, he was an outright Satanist. He admitted as much that Awas was Lucifer and, you know, the devil of the starry universe. So he just, he just concealed it and uh, camouflaged it much better than maybe uh, kind of a, you know, person like LaVey. So, William, before we run out of time, because I've kind of babbled on about a lot lot of my stuff, one of the important things about your work, especially with Crowley, is you give the direct connections to present day culture, like Timothy Leary might be one that some people have known that for a while, but some people don't. Obviously, the music industry, the Hollywood industry, and this, you know, just admiration and this kind of blind devotion. And you can only imagine the feedback we're going to get from this show. I mean, because there's some real Crowley defenders and they're just out to stomp out, you know, anyone who says that. Connections to important cultural figures in time at Crowley. Well, I mean, you can just go back through so many influential people, whether it's Hubbard, whether it's Leary whether it's Jimmy Page, Kenneth Anger, who's associated with the Manson family. I mean, he literally lived with Bobby Bouzele, and Bobby Bouzele was in Lucifer Rising. And it's some, uh, one element of the whole uh, corpus of works about Manson that you almost never hear about is that Bouzele, who murdered him and was living with Anger, was in a movie with him, who was also considered himself a warlock and was also associated with so many other cultural events and still alive still alive today believe it or not anchor has been friends with jack parsons and and marjorie cameron all the way to today and also it's also an element of the elite because one of his great sponsors was j paul getty jr one of the richest men in the world who paid whenever anger wanted to take flights he just got a car launch payment from the getty family which tells you a lot about the elite and getty used to get in do all kinds of weird rituals and tombs and stuff. <laughs> kind of like, I mean, it's just, you really, if you really look past the, the curtain of these people, they're much darker than you can imagine. So um, I think that that culture is very important and it's usually left out. And these histories of these people, they probably, like I said, it's an expurgated herd. It's a selective history. So if you, we can go back to the very beginning of our t- talk, where if you have a materialist, Darwinist, uh, you know, a person without a kind of a spiritual view, they just won't even look at these things as important markers upon character and how that character plays itself out in the real world. They just won't even accept it. Then if you have the occultists, they're deliberately keeping that out. So do you have a, there's a real history, historiographical problem because a lot of these people move into these not, into these characters and their understanding of what they're really doing because there's parties deliberately, whether because of their own inherent biases or intentionally because they're occultists, which is to hide something, keeping that out. So, and that's really when you see these characters, how if you don't get all the facets of their character and like Hubbard, who was the source, I mean, all the same kind of fake prophecy type stuff, uh, how, how, how toxic and dangerous Hubbard really was in Scientology, if you don't see that part of his connection to Crowley, you could probably, you could literally have your soul raped by him and that whole organization. You know, kind of related to that, it took me a long time to come to this realization about the, the atheist materialist, you know, there's no meaning, you're a biological robot. The whole top of your brain is just a big deceiver of reality to... Uh, perpetrate perpetrate your genes. That's all it is. It's impossible for me to accept 
that that isn't conspiracy also, that that isn't point. That's orchestrated point. because right. what it, it just totally fits into the playbook, you know, and people don't yeah. realize that to do that, it doesn't require a completely orchestrated kind of thing. You just put the cheese in the maze where you want these little rats to run and they, they don't even know what they're doing, but they're, they're doing the bidding of someone who says, hell yes, I want people to think that life is meaningless and to just be materialists and consumers. That fits in perfectly. Well, let me, yeah, let yeah. me just follow add to that because it's like if you're an elitist, that's what you want your, the people who are your slave serving to believe. There's no meaning. Don't make any changes. There's no action on your behalf. I mean, if you look at Darwin and really unpack the origin of species, it really is a big race tract, and it has its own ideology outside of science. It's about the most favored, favored races to, and the struggle for survival, right? That's the subtext of it. If you ever see Darwin, he's making the occult sign of silence. So this kind of occultism has been around forever, pre-Crowley. He just adapted and adopted it, stole it, or lifted. But um, it puts Darwin in a completely different light about what his real objectives were and why the Royal Society wanted to promote those objectives, which is basically the King and Queen of England. So well, it justified their whole empire, right? Totally. And, and especially if they're at the top, the global empire. I'm sorry. No, 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 that's, I'm sorry, but especially we did a bunch of shows on uh, Wallace, you know, who is the contemporary of, if you go back in the history books, like 50 years, the co-discoverers of evolution were Darwin and Wallace, especially if you go back 75 right. And Wallace is kind of erased out because Wallace comes to the conclusion that there's a higher order of consciousness to this. There's no getting around it. And in fact, I've had some scholars on here and I think make a very convincing case that Darwin plagiarized Wallace's writings in order to get his, get his theory because he didn't have the data. Wallace was in the field collecting just widely the data. He stops on the Galapagos Islands, which is great, you know, but he gets this very narrow bit. Wallace is, you know, he's the working man kind of thing. He's out there having to struggle and collect all these things. I forget where he was, but, you know, anyways, that's a story for another time. Because here's the other question I, I wanted to skip back and really, really dig into this one. What do you make of, you know, we see the Hollywood thing and we like we get that, that Johnny Depp is in, you know, I, it, he just looks like a tragic figure to me. He just looks like somebody whose soul has been sucked out of him. You know, and so many people, I know that's going to sound kind of churchy to people, but I don't, I, it, it, don't you see that? I mean, don't you see that in some of these people, but other ones, you, you feel like maybe they're just being duped and that's where you really feel sorry. They're going to the parties and, you know, Abranovich is, you know, cutting up the cake and isn't this cool? And they don't understand what's at play or do you think they do? Well, I mean, I could probably analogize it to my life. They had just a naive view of certain things. You know, I had a very naive view of American politics. I, you know, and there's a lot more going on under the surface than you could imagine. And it's probably the same in Hollywood. People wanted to be famous or they wanted to be in the arts and they may not even know what it takes to get to the top. And I think that Hollywood, for example, at least recently, I think you've got to be initiated to get to the top one way or another. You're either into pedophilia or occultism or just something dark. So everybody knows something about somebody else, you know? And that's why like a guy like Weinstein was raping people for decades. I know the most, the, the amount of people who come forward is probably just, you know, a tip of the iceberg for that guy. So there's something really creepy going on in Hollywood. And I think a lot of those guys, if you really read about some of these stories, it just, I mean, if you, have you ever read crazy days and nights? It's a really good, it's a really good website, but they are leaking information from these guys that they're just monsters, man. A lot of these stars and celebrities and directors were child rapists. I mean, bad. So I think that, that's how the system kind of, and a lot of people who survive, some people don't survive in Hollywood. They crack and they leave or they just are disillusioned. But the ones that have been there forever, Johnny Depp's a perfect example. If you look at this court case that he's having with Amber Heard's involvement, they have a recording of that guy just howling in pain. Like there's something like about him that, uh, 
yeah, it's raw. I mean, you can, his association, association with Eccles and he was one of the chief financial backers to get Eccles out along with Peter Jackson. So, um, do you know who uh, Chris Knowles is? He writes a blog. Yeah, yeah I know Chris Knowles. You know, I, I mm-hmm. interviewed uh, Chris a few weeks ago, and uh, I think he's like me. He has some friends who, you know, we like and respect, but are kind of in this magic community, and we keep going, what are you doing, guys? But he said it so perfectly. He said, you know, if you think you're talking to this demon or this entity, and they're going to do these fantastic things for you, what do you have to offer in return? And I thought, isn't that, doesn't that just ring true on a kind of personal level? How do you think you're going to make that deal work? You have nothing except your soul to give. And that's what you will be asked to give at one point or another, you know? Very good point. Very good point. Hey, last, last point, and then I'll wrap it up. I appreciate you. Okay. I'm push it right up to the 90 minutes. Russ Dizdar has a really interesting theory. It's going to sound completely wacky to a lot of people, but I got a lot of reason to believe that he's on the right thing. And that a lot of times when you hear about this sexual abuse of children, pedophilia, that it's not even so much about sexual abuse. It's about traumatizing children in order to create this disassociative identity disorder because it is a direct link to making them more vulnerable to spiritual attack. And the crazy thing about that is that connects directly to stuff we've learned about MK Ultra, and that we were trying to weaponize that disassociative identity disorder aspect because we learned that it's almost like a technology. It's a secret code. Yes. And what do you think about that? Do you have any thoughts? If you're I, I that? think he's right. I think he's right. I think that that's true. I mean, I think that that's I mean, in a very dark way. A lot of the stuff that happens in the Catholic Church is to keep people in the Catholic Church so they get traumatized, right? They become helpless. They become less less uh, active, so to speak, or authoritative. So I think that that's, that's definitely, uh, belie- I mean, believable, right? I think that that's what they're doing. They're, tr- they're deliberately traumatizing the kids as well. Yeah, for sure. Hey, and you William. can see that in, in some of these cases, McMartin and stuff, the kids are deliberately being traumatized. Or, or the finder's case. I mean, they're, so, these, they're all using these same techniques and these strange occultists are running the whole show. Look at the finder's case, man. Terrifying. William, well, we can get into deliberate tra- traumatization in 9-11. I mean, incredible. It's traumatizing if you think the government did it or it's traumatizing if you think that some guy in a cave in Afghanistan did it. So when you get into weaponized traumatization, then you're at this, that the, just the thought that someone has figured out that they can get a leg up by doing that is really scary, especially in this Super extended scary. realm. Yeah. Very scary. And, you know, the traumatization starts and then the suggestion follows, right? So you traumatize and then the suggestion and then... You've opened up the you know, door. So have, yeah. And then you, you're you absolutely right. Then you have this kind of... Uh, approach this this technique that they know right it's a known you know skill it becomes a skill and that they develop that i mean this book you should have a uh, o'neill tom o'neill is a guest the book chaos about manson he uncovered information that these guys these jolly and west and greenberg were in communication with each other talking about creating hypnotized people and traumatizing them all the way back in the 50s and 60s and they had to lie about these techniques and say it's not possible because that was the that was the cover on the truth that they could literally hypnotize people through traumatization and stuff like that. If you look at Sirhan Sirhan, like I've talked to authors about that, he disappeared for two weeks. They don't even know where he was. They think he was in some kind of California was really crazy in the sixties. Holy smokes. Anyway, that's off topic. But it kind of is this technique you're talking about. Somebody some of these wizards and materialists like Jolly and West who had his son kill his, him and his wife in a freaking uh, assisted suicide, which is super dark. I uh, knew that stuff. Okay. I was going to try and wrap it up, but you've kind of opened something up. No, I, I, I want, so I want you to, I want you to close. I want you to close that door because it brings it around full circle. You're talking about it. And I love that you just kind of just the facts, ma'am, but connect that 
what does that mean on a political level? You know, we can talk right. about local politics or national politics or geopolitically, you know, I mean, what does that mean? We are part of that, right? We live yes. here and we are part yes. of what, How do you process it's that? It's terrifying. Well, it's terrifying. Like this book, The Shock Doctrine, they think that these political leaders, all the way back to the overthrow of Allende, duly elected guy in Chile, of Pinochet, that they have learned this technique of how to terrify a populace where you don't even have to um, use force because the psychological traumatization is so strong that people will be terrified to do anything. And so I think that that is a horrible conclusion, just the implication of that and the conclusion of that happening in other countries and possibly even here. If you read Mind War by, uh, oh, what is it, Valeli and uh, what's that, I can't remember, uh, Michael Aquino, there's a guy. Don't be surprised if these guys are using it on you. I mean, that's what's really scary is these well, techniques, they know it. William, I, I've avoided in, in all my shows, even talking about COVID, never brought it up. But the trauma part yeah. is, just, yeah. is just unavoidable when you start putting together these cases and you're talking about mm -hmm. Chile, you know, and let's get everyone in the, in the soccer stadium and turn on the lights and keep them there right. for, you know, yes. two days. And then let's just take two of them out and shoot them. That's all we have to do is just kill two of them and bring back the bodies. And now everyone can go home. That's it. Yeah, you only point. killed two. You know, yeah. They only killed in that whole overthrow. They only killed 3000 people considering it was a huge country. It's not, I mean, compare it's a tragedy, but to, to pacify the entire country, it's not that many people dead. So, so William, it, it's been just, Awesome having you on, especially this end part. I hope people can get an appreciation for just, gosh, the depth of knowledge. And I almost feel like maybe we didn't, we, I pulled you around in too many of the wrong places, but I couldn't help it because you just know so much and I wanted to pick and poke at so many different things. Tell folks how they can stay on top of this work, where they can find you you're going and keep up with your shows and keep up with your books and maybe what's on the, the horizon coming up. Well, I've been doing documentaries recently, so my documentaries can be found on Vimeo under William Ramsey. I have five documentaries there, and then I kind of do a podcast, William Ramsey Investigates, which you can get on iTunes or Spreaker or anything like that. I have a lot of old research into the West Memphis Three on my YouTube channel, which I'm trying to kind of just morph away from or use less, but there's old videos there if you want to see my research going back with all these other characters at William Ramsey Investigates. And, uh, you know, I have three books that I wrote about these different subjects, which you can find on Amazon, or my website is williamramseyinvestigates.com if you want signed copies. And William Ramsey Investigates, I just want to tell people again, you it's, it's up-to-date stuff. You know, we've just been kind of in this one little lane, but you're talking to all sorts of different interesting people and really digging in in that kind of attorney style, get to the facts kind of thing. So like, who were some of the guests that you've had on recently that you were really excited to interview? And who are some of the people you have coming up? Well, just like I, I talked to you, I talked to Tom O'Neill about his book, Chaos. I highly recommend that book. Um, I talked to a really good book about uh, the, let's sit liberal. If you want to talk about a huge psyop, it's the People's, uh, no, it was the Symbionese Liberation Army. The book is Revolution's End by Schreiber. Highly recommend that book because it was just one tiny little piece of this Operation Chaos where a fake leftist organization, in my opinion, and I think the author's opinion as well, was created to subvert the left. Um, and it was the Symbionese Liberation Army and this guy, Sin K. Uh, and I would highly recommend that book because it'll it'll twist your ideas about I'd highly how recommend these, that interview you yeah, did. Yeah. That yeah. was a great, no, really good. Now Brad Schreiber is his name. Highly recommend. Good, great writer. And then I also lease a piece about RFK and Sirhan Sirhan about political assassination. So, you know, I'm really definitely interested in parapolitics. So, and I think that those books all back up their, their premises and their positions. I think that uh, Sirhan Sirhan was a patsy. And my, it had real, something was going on with him. He was a subject of something really creepy. So um, how, those are just some examples. I'm trying, you know, not everybody says yes to my interviews, but I think I've been very fortunate to 
get really good authors. I do read the books, so I definitely try to be an informed interviewer and not try to get anything away. Just focus on the, the context in the book and make people make their argument or why they have this position. And, and I think that, you know, I've had people from, it's a, you know, I try, I'm not, I'm, div, div, I'm done with like political parties. So I don't really have a partisan ax to grind. And uh, I think that benefits talking to people. So I think in that regard, I, I'm pleased with some of the interviews I've done recently for sure. Well, fantastic. It's, uh, it's been absolutely great having you on and I, I hope people do check out William Ramsey investigate. So thanks again. Well, it's great to talk with you, man. It's, it's really good to be with uh, somebody as well informed as you. So it's been a delight for me. Thanks again to William Ramsey for joining me today on Skeptico. He is quite impressive in terms of his knowledge of this topic and his ability to dive deep with all the legal stuff. So it was really great having him on. The one question I'd tee up from this interview is, where do you come down on Damian Eccles in the West Memphis Three with regard particularly to satanic panic? Is he the poster boy he's made out to be for satanic panic? Or was there enough satanic stuff going on in and around his life? You know, I didn't bring up the thing with his mother, but, you know, his mother gave birth to him when she was like 15 years old. And it's just such a dysfunctional, you you have to, you cannot uh, go through this and not feel sorry for this kid, Damien Eccles, even though, you know, he did what he did. But, you know, his mother, His mother is into all this stuff and gets him into all this satanic stuff, you know, and that's never really, that's all kind of washed away and obscured in this kind of ocean of, oh, it's all satanic panic, witch hunt craziness, which it's not, in my opinion. But what's your opinion? This is supposed to be a question, so let me tee it up as a question. What do you think? Satanic panic? Yes or no? I realize it's going to be kind of hard to answer that one since I came down pretty strong on it, but but it's kind of a hot button issue for me. Do let me know what you think. Stay with me for all these future shows coming up. I got a bunch of them. I don't know how I'm going to get them all out, but they're coming. Until next time, take care. Bye for now. <laughs>